Good morning. Uh, dear speakers, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of Riga Graduate School of Law, I welcome you to today's event, a public lecture on challenges for the European recovery. And today we have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Rolf Strauch, the Chief Economist of European Stability Mechanism. And he's also joined by Mr. Jürgen Klaus, ESM Team D, Derivatives and Market Intelligence Funding. The European Stability Mechanism has a mandate to preserve financial stability in the Euro area by providing financial assistance to member states with severe financing problems. It is a permanent intergovernmental institution operating since October 2012. The shareholders of the ESM are the 90 Euro area member states. Early in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic struck Europe with a significant impact on economies and the markets. And swift and comprehensive policy response followed at national and European level. And this has contained the economic impact of the pandemic. However, there are still some spillover risks from businesses to banks and to countries. And these risks need to be carefully taken into account for any exit strategy and in the view of sustainable recovery. These and other issues shall be touched upon today by today's speakers. The event is scheduled for approximately one hour. And we encourage you to use the possibility and ask questions in the chat in the Q&A uh, area. And uh, your questions will be monitored and answered in the questions and answers session after the presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Strauch and Mr. Klaus for joining us today and wish everyone an engaging session. And with now, without further ado, I'm pleased to give the floor or screen to Dr. Strauch. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... Good morning from Luxembourg and a uh, big thank you to the Riga Graduate School of Law for organizing uh, this event. Obviously, it would be nicer to be in your beautiful capital and uh, not to sit here at this side of the, of the camera and separate with a plastic wall from Jürgen, but this is the world we are living in. And uh, in any case, I hope also that we will have a good conversation and um, an and, and interesting uh, hour, share an interesting hour together. Now, the pandemic has left deep scars in terms of health and safety with many people, and obviously has also led to economic and societal disruptions within Europe and around the world. At this stage, at least in Europe, we seem to get over the immediate impact through the rollout of successful rollout of vaccination campaigns. So at this stage, it's a good moment to also pause. And let me ask you, how would you envisage the recovery of Latvia? And more importantly, for today's conversation, how would you envisage Europe to recover? And how do you see Europe five years from now? Now, I'm an economist, and as an economist, I firmly believe that economic policy making aims to enable sustainable wealth and equitable prosperity. And that is certainly what I would very much wish for the European recovery, sustainable wealth and equitable prosperity. And that will be the focus of today's discussion and of the presentation that Jürgen and I will do in order to spell out the opportunities and challenges that, that we see. In order to do so, we will first go back to the past crisis and the past crisis experience in order to see how it went then and explain the vicious cycle that countries experienced at the time that actually destroyed a lot of prosperity. And then we turn to the current crisis to explain more how public initiatives and private investment can interact in order to create a virtuous cycle that brings us towards a more powerful, more equitable and sustainable recovery. That is what we want to do um, in, in the next 40 minutes or so. And then we will, we will discuss those points. So let me briefly turn to the past crisis. And most people in Latvia obviously have strong memories about it because your country 
experienced one of the most severe recessions in modern economic history in the year 2008, 2010, where actually your output dropped by 20%, which is very severe. And at the time, your government, your central bank, had a very tough choice to take. Um, it was about keeping the peg and therefore the prospect of joining monetary union and adjusting internally or alternatively abandoning the peg and giving up on this prospect of joining monetary union soon. In that moment then, well, some economists advised to, to leave the to leave to abandon the pack, but actually you decided to stick to your guns and actually you carried this through. And eventually in 2014, you joined Monetary Union, you also became a member of the ESM. I think this was a hard, very, very hard-earned success, and you can still be proud of it today that you actually made it because it was then also starting point for a remarkable recovery where you actually very much reduced unemployment that was close to 20% and you reduced it to 6%, which is below the euro area average. And also your growth was very strong. So that today you can look at the Latvian economy as a fundamentally sound economy. Now, several other countries were affected by the pandemic, uh, by, sorry, by the financial crisis, obviously as well. And that were countries like Greece, Ireland, Cyprus, Portugal, and Spain that eventually lost market access at affordable prices. What happened in those countries was what became known as the doom loop between governments and the banking system. The banking system wasn't healthy and therefore the government had to step in to safeguard it, to protect the clients, to protect the population, and that actually led to a loss of credibility of markets in governments. Or the government was overly indebted and market lost confidence, which again had negative repercussions on the banks that held the bonds of those of the, of the government. So in that regard, what we had experienced was actually a vicious cycle, a doom loop, loop between banks and sovereigns. In order to address the situation and adjust overcome the imbalances that had built up in, the, in those economies, and also to, to safeguard the banking system, to safeguard European stability, then governments created the European Financial Stability Facility in 2010, and afterwards the ESM, European Stability Mechanism in 2012. Over those years, over the past decade, we have dispersed about 300, 295 billion, about 300 billion of loans to Ireland, Portugal, Greece, and Spain, and Cyprus. And as part of those programs, as part of the financial support, we also asked those countries to do structural reforms, to do reforms to overcome the inherent weaknesses in the economy. And that, to a large extent, actually mirrors the experience that Latvia had in crisis, because it was partly, and in some cases very much, a very harsh and even socially and politically painful experience. We can proudly say that eventually also those countries regained market access, overcame the problem. And I think it's also fair to say that without our support, actually the Euro area today would not be in the same position as it is because we helped to save the integrity of the Euro area. So what we see from that experience is actually that additional effort was necessary to strengthen growth and fully recover and overcome the legacies of the financial crisis and catch up with past trajectories of growth. And let me show you one slide here to make very clearly the point is that this worked in a number of cases, but it did not work everywhere. Seems that there is a technical problem in sharing the slide. 
I hope we can cure that, Albert. One second. Well, it doesn't work. Let me then just tell it to you. What we see is that indeed, thanks to the reforms that were implemented, indeed in those countries that pursued those reforms and at, during those years after the crisis, actually it was Latvia, but also Greece, Spain and Ireland and Portugal that emerged as reform champions within Europe. They could pick recover the past level of prosperity and even pick up with the past growth trend. But there were other countries where actually old problems re-emerged and this was not possible. Most notably, that was the case for Italy and Italy has not even recovered the level of per capita income that it had before the crisis. So one factor that actually was is holding back growth is investment. And what we notice with investment is that after the crisis, it was very much uncertainty that held back companies from investing. And a second factor that emerged is the, lever the, the, the leveraging of the uh, corporate sector that prevented them from investing because they first wanted to, so to speak, redeem and lower the debt burden, the leverage that they were experiencing. Sorry, just, are we done? Stable? Good. So that is why this vicious cycle of balance sheet repair that we had in the past crisis actually had a protracted shadow on the economy and less to, led to a persistent loss of wealth in a number of cases and not allowing for catching up with what, um, with the growth trend and the prosperity that kind has experienced before. Now, that was 10 years ago. Let us look at the pandemic now and let us see whether there is reason, whether there are differences and whether there is a reason to be more optimistic. And here, I think an important part is to notice first that the origin of the crisis is very different. And in this regard, what is good is that it emerged from a common shock, but not from the fact that there are excessive macroeconomic imbalances in the euro area or in some euro area countries that need to be adjusted. Rather, there is this health crisis per se, but it meets countries that in very many respects are also more healthy, economically more healthy, than they were at the, at the, during the past crisis. And one point where this becomes particularly important, particularly noteworthy, is when we look at the banking sector. As I just said, the banking sector in the earlier crisis was a shock amplifier, a doom loop. This time around, actually, the banking sector is a shock resolver. The banking sector actually managed to extend substantial credit to the economy to mitigate the impact of the crisis. And that is a crucial lifeline because European economies are largely bank financed. This was supported by a set of measures, most importantly, central bank measures, regulatory measures that allowed for lending, but also by uh, budgetary measures where governments provided guarantees for credit to the corporate sector. So that this was actually allowed for this strengthening of the economy and banks to be a shock, shock absorber. On top of that, governments did a lot to keep workers on the job, keep them in firms rather than from being dismissed and, and, and creating big bulks of unemployment. That also was a very successful and very effective measure taken during the crisis. Next to the national measures, we also have to note that almost instantaneously, the European initiative kind of got started and actually very early on support packages at the European level were decided. 
And here, the first set of measures was a combined package of support from the ESM, from the European Commission, and the European Investment Bank for a total amount of 540 billion to support workers through the European Commission, to support companies through the European Investment Bank, and also to support governments with their health, healthcare measures through the ESM. The next big package that was then decided was less aimed at the immediate liquidity needs in the during the pandemic, but already started to envisage the recovery and think about the recovery. And this is the next generation EU, a package of 750 billion, which is meant to boost investment and reforms in the EU. What is important for all those measures is that they very much entail an element of solidarity. The objective was to help particularly those countries that are most in need, which are most affected by the pandemic or where there's a stronger need for catching up in terms of income. Now, having explained those packages, so national and European support measures, they had a substantive market impact. And let me now turn over to Jürgen, who will kind of look at the market impact and elaborate on that. Thank you. A very good morning. Um, my name is Jürgen. I'm working with markets um, a lot, and I would like to share some light on how the measures Rolf just mentioned have materialized in markets, what did happen. And you want a short answer to a long discussion. It's European solidarity. European solidarity, which was not only talked, but also walked, so to say, which means the measures we have seen um, in the combined packages Rolf just mentioned helped to calm or keep calm markets overall compared to the recent crisis. And um, in the slide deck we can share later, I will quickly describe the slides. We can, I'm not sure if you do, do you want to try it again? Uh, maybe it works. Yes. Okay. That makes my life a bit easier. Thank you. Um, so, we like to look at indicators of stress in markets. You know that markets uh, can be very ex exhaustively erratic, move in volatility, and we have different um, uh, indicators to measure market stress. Shown here, and I like to zoom out a little bit before we look a bit more into the pandemic crisis, because as Rolf just mentioned, um, not only for economists, but also for uh, financial market participants, it's often important to understand the context if you try to understand what's happened currently. Um, and here we zoom into roughly 20 years back. What do we see here? First, um, we can see an index. You can write a lot of papers about this. Uh, if you Google it, there's, there is indeed quite some. But what it shows us is a degree of financial market stress in yellow. The higher the number is in the positive area, so up to 0 0.9 the more stress the financial markets face. And in blue, you see the US equivalent. Um, the CIS indicator, or KISS, if you want to uh, correctly pronounce it, is a combined measure of different market segments, um, mainly based uh, financial stress segments, uh, which involve five categories. These are the intermediate sector, the money market, the sector, the equities, of course, bond markets, which we look later a little bit more into, and um, broadly, this gives us an indication of how financial markets perceive stress. What's the key message here? Two things I'd like to point out. First, of course, you can see in 2008, so around the middle part of this chart, the uh, massive outbreaks during the great financial crisis. And second, um, if you now look into the um, 2020 range, you can see that the um, yellow and, of course, the Blue, char, uh, blue line as well, uh, sees a spike. But what's important here is this, this spike or this increase is a much lower magnitude and extent as we have seen them in the recent crisis. And that is important because this European solidarity brought up uh, in, a, in a combined package, as Rolf just mentioned, um, caused a lot of this quick calming of markets. And um, we have must we have, we have seen much faster reactions as well. And when, if we zoom in chart two, 
into the pandemic circle, as we would call it. So market feedback indicates, so not only the stress indicators, but also the qualitative feedback we gather that this combination of packages was a key driver to keep markets calm. If you look at the chart again, you know the methodology now a little bit, you see a stress index uh, really spiking up again at the very beginning of uh, the COVID outbreak we've marked it in, Mar in February. Um, it's definitely in the first quarter, you may all agree, you can argue about the date. However, what you can see here is uh, an increase in financial market stress in the Euro area, as well as the uh, US. And some key points, and Rolf mentioned some of them. Um, one is the French-German recovery fund proposal, which then at the end led to what we call the recovery fund for short. Uh, this is marked in the area of, uh, in, in May, you can see 18th of May. And there's another element for us market people who's, everyone who's looking in this, it's, it's about the PEP announcement. PEP is the pandemic uh, emerging um, purchase, sorry, now I'm, now I'm screwing it up myself and I look at my notes, the pandemic emergency purchase program. And this was a big, big announcement for the markets and it improved market functioning and also reduced stress to a considerable degree, as you can see with also the yellow curve going down again from these levels. Um, and now we are basically back on the very right-hand side to pre-crisis levels with regards to financial services. So it was a swift implementation that helped to calm down markets. And one other swift implementation I um, want to mention here is the ESM's pandemic crisis support. This was made available in May 2020, May 2020. We started in March, uh, February, March with this horrible pandemic. And in May already, we were able to provide an umbrella, which together with the uh, ECB's PEP program, um, we basically have two parts secured. One is the market functioning and market levels. And second, if needed, the ESM created a safety net uh, for the euro area to ensure that additional financing can be made available at short notice if needed. And the next slide shows, after I mentioned this PEP announcement, the yields in the 10-year area, for exemplary, we took a couple of euro area members over time since uh, January 2020. What we see here, the key message is we have seen a high uncertainty in rates until May 2020. So you see the announcement in March, and this is basically the spike in the refinancing rate of the applicable countries. You can see that we had a, from January to March, a relatively calm phase if you then see the erupt move. And between March and May, and that's something I would like to point out with regards to solidarity and joint measures, um, we have seen a bit more volatility, but then after the French recovery fund proposal, we moved lower in yields and we still are at historically low yields and currently even partly lower than uh, prior to the pandemic outbreak. And um, one last point shown in the chart here, it's the tapering discussion. Tapering means in normal English that the discussion about any measures we have seen in the PEP or the QE announcements, quantitative easing of the European Central Bank should be at one point and probably will be um, also reduced. And the markets discussed this. And my key point here was what happens once we discuss some reduction of measures? Will markets go into stress? Will levels rise again on refinancing? They do not. And I think it's important to really flag that point that they really don't see any reason in markets to be worried about further crisis development at this point in stage. So at present, the 10-year rates are partly below the pre-crisis pandemic level. Um, and the last point um, I want to really po point out here is bear in mind, we are at very low interest rates. And the next level here, thank you, uh, the next level shows us the, um, the it's, a, it's a spread chart, we call it. So what do we see here? It's basically like a risk measurement. On the left side, you see uh, in basis points, a basis point 0.01%. Uh, 
uh, an indicator of stress. It's like a fever thermometer, if you wish, in the way uh, to simplify it a bit. And it shows basically the risk charge the different countries have to pay on top of the German equivalents. German uh, bond markets are often used as a safe asset, uh, very well rated and often a reference to. And you can see here differently than to the, the chart we had before, it's not the absolute yield level shown, but it's basically the market uh, premium, risk premium. And you can see a similar pattern. And that's also important because it tells us that even if rates would be overall higher, we still have here the so-called risk charge or credit spread, as we call it, at very favorable and low levels. And this is very important because usually the higher the premium, shown as the rate difference here in the colorful lines, uh, the higher the risk. And that was a key element in previous crisis, as Rolf just mentioned. So what does it all mean now? First, market stress levels increased less and recovered faster during this crisis. And second, the financial finance, the financing levels through, in terms of spreads and absolute levels are very favorable, uh, historical low, and also with regards to credit risk at very satisfying conditions for issuers. And third, the support measures, they need to continue as long as the pandemic constrains the economy. And as we need to support the virtuous cycle we see here in this combination of efforts uh, to regain economic growth. And the current historical low interest rates environment means that also there is time and there is room for countries to do the work which has to be done. And lastly, we should really remind ourselves market sentiment can be very volatile and interest rates are expected at one point to also rise. But despite the comfort of the current favorable financing conditions, the countries need to look forward. They need to start mapping out a credible fiscal path to keep this market trust and to manage the debt levels in a sustainable way. And on this, I would hand over to Rolf again, who will discuss some policy challenges to achieve this goal. Thank you very much, Jürgen. So this was about the virtuous cycle that we could indeed create over the pandemic between from public measures and financial market reaction. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, economic policy is about the creation of sustainable wealth and equitable prosperity. And let me try to be a little bit more operational in what I mean with this for the recovery and give it another try whether we manage to show this slide, which I really want to share with you um, because it makes it in a way also operational what I have in mind. What I would wish is that the Euro area countries could catch up or even surpass the pre-pandemic growth level and growth path, and none of the countries is left behind. And that is what is shown in this chart that shows actually the challenges of, and opportunities. So at the start, you see for the Euro area, how output was actually reduced from the 2019 level which is geared, geared to 100%. So output dropped. We are now in the recovery. It's expected that by 22, we will have caught up with the level of income in at the end of 2019. But that's not all. That shouldn't be all the aspiration. That is not all what this is about. But actually, the objective should be, and the objective can be, to actually catch up with this green dotted line, which is the path of growth that was envisaged before. And not only that, it could be even if we all make, can make good use of the recovery plans, it can actually be more. We can actually try to overachieve and not only catch up, but have additional efficiency gain, have additional growth forces that bring us above that earlier trend. There is the risk, of course, that one would fall behind and not achieve it. And what I will now go through is actually what we talked before, the interaction between public initiatives and financial markets, private investment, that order should generate this virtuous cycle that brings us to the upper growth path. That is what uh, is about. And let me now outline a couple of elements and initiatives that are very important in this respect. And we can turn. Now, the first point, as I said before, 
what differentiates this crisis is that the banking sector was not the cause of the problem, but actually helped to cure the problem. And that is, it was part of the solution. And that was the consequence of many of the measures that were taken between the past crisis and the current crisis. So a lot of measures taken on banking union, and you all have heard about it, the common supervisory structure, the European Resolution Authority, the common rule book, all the efforts that were made in order to make banks safer. And again, this is very important because banks, the banking sector is the lifeline of our economy. Economic financing of corporates to 70% comes from banks. So those banks need to be part of the recovery and a strong banking sector. Now, we have, start, we have created banking union, but the process is not complete. There is one important element that is actually currently under decision, which is the ratification of the ESM treaty. A key part of the changed ESM treaty is that the ESM will become the common backstop to the single resolution fund. So we have a common resolution structure in Europe, and now the ESM will be the common backstop. And that does two things. First, it helps to unravel, to kind of undo the doom loop between sovereigns and banks at the national level. That is one important point. The second important point is that it makes sure that the taxpayers don't have to pay for banking problems. It's fiscally neutral in the medium term because whatever resources would be used would be paid back by the banking sector. So these are important features of the backstop and it's an important element for completing banking union in creating a safer common environment across Europe. There is another element to the ESM, that uh, ESM reform that is currently be, being decided, which is that the ESM in future crises or if in future programs would have a stronger role for the overall design and jointly with the European Commission also would look into the policy conditionality, the measures needed in order to get the, the, the countries back to markets. Now, the ESM thus will become a backbone of banking union, but more steps are needed here. And we know that some of the structural deficiencies in the European banking sector still persist. And in some countries, there is still relatively low competitiveness and low profitability of banks. And what we need is to take further steps to, to have a common safe ground. And here a key element missing is a common deposit insurance scheme. And we need to work further to make an integrated banking sector where banks are not facing excessive costs from operating in different countries. This may sound somewhat surprising for a country like Latvia, where you have a lot of foreign subsidiaries actually operating in your banking sector, but it still persists. There are constraints on liquidity and capital that make those cross-border operations more expensive and that actually pre prevent from a further integration of the banking sector in other parts of Europe. So banking union is clearly one important part because we need banks to provide financing. But bank financing is not the only one, the only financing source that is needed. As we see from the past crisis, that can extending credit can actually also lead to an over leveraging of the corporate sector and then the corporate sector will be prevented from investment. So we also need to make sure that there's other kind of financing that is available for companies and particularly for startups that are typically too risky for banks to easily provide loans. And what we therefore need is more kind of equity finance for companies in order to get them going without overburdening them. So in order to achieve this, there's another important initiative, which is Capital Market Union that wants to strengthen and broaden capital markets in Europe and also integrate them. And particularly for equity and ensure that also smaller and medium sized companies have access to equity financing, which will be important. Now, as important as this 
initiative is in order to get there, it will probably only be possible to achieve this in the medium run because a lot of changes need to be made. And also people need to get used to and need to be educated to actually invest in equity, which is risky and where you want also the investor to be well informed. So this is a process that takes time and we need more immediate support. And here I think it will be also unavoidable that the public sector steps in and provides some form of equity finance. Some countries have done that already and created actually investment funds. Others are thinking about it and creating equity type uh, financing. Another element to be considered is whether governments also maybe want to convert the loans that they provided during the pandemic into equity in order to alleviate the burden for companies. So this is a second important element where public-private interaction can actually support the recovery. As a third element and as a final policy area, let me focus a bit on the fiscal side, which is obviously very important. And here first, really also note the landmark change that emerged with the next generation EU. Next generation EU has in several respects a different quality from the crisis support that could, provide, could be provided and was adequate for the past crisis. But given that we have here this common shock, new answers were found and those answers add to actually the solution and to the recovery in, in several respects. First is next generation EU is redistribution. And that is obviously important when I say that I would not want anyone to be left behind. There should not be countries that are left behind. So some form of redistribution where countries that were particularly hit by the crisis or countries with a relatively low income, like your country, are supported more than other countries. So this is one element and it's done within next generation EU, even through transfers, not through loans. So direct fiscal support. Second element is that next generation EU is focused on the transformation of the economy. You have probably read or seen the program that your country, your government put up for the reform plan and the focus of activity, which is on green and digital to a large extent. And that is in order to make our economies fit for the future to not just rebuild, but to build something new and to have this kind of sustained recovery. So that is the second very important element. The third part is all that also matters a lot is what we talked about before, which is the combination of financial support and reforms. So the recovery plans are not only about investment priorities, they're also about other steps that governments want to do in order to strengthen growth or to revive the economy through education, through maybe also better healthcare. So other measures that actually support a stronger and safer growth. So from that perspective, for me, Next Generation EU certainly provides a big opportunity for Europe to achieve this objective that I outlined at the start. And I think it's one of the big challenges is actually to make best use of it. And we know that the absorption capacity of governments has been limited in the past in terms of absorbing external finance that comes in from the EU. So government need to ramp up also their capacity. And then should be uh, insurance, governments need to try not to fall into reform fatigue, but actually live up to the plans that they put forward. Now, next to, to the, this initiative, I think it's also important to think about the European fiscal framework. Within the European fiscal framework, the Commission has created space to support the economies by invoking the general escape clause on the stability and growth pact. We have said before, and, and Jürgen made the point that support should be continued as long as necessary in order to facilitate that 
the European Commission has now also decided that they want to continue under the general escape clause until into next year and leave it in place. So that generates some fiscal space that is important also for countries to have in order to give the necessary support. But we also need to have a longer look because with next year, not everything is done. And some countries may, uh, may have relative, still relatively high deficits and there could be disruptions in kind of revoking them very drastically. So we need to see that we get a smooth transition towards a steady state. And in that regard, we should be looking into the fiscal framework overall. And here for us, there is a more general point. So first we can recognize that we are now in a different and macroeconomic environment where yes, we have high debt levels, but at the same time, we have strong investment needs and we have significantly lower interest rates than we had in the 1990s when the Stability and Growth Pact was created. As Jürgen said, and I fully agree, there is the risk that interest rates, or we expect interest rates to rise. That's true. But I think on average, they will not rise to the levels that we have seen in the 1990s. So maybe there is also one can think about a higher debt carrying capacity of countries. And that could be a point on which to reflect in order to see whether there is reason or scope to adjust part of the fiscal framework. What would be behind it is, however, the key point is to make the fiscal framework more credible, more transparent. That is how we should try to look at the rules in order to simplify them and in order to make them more effective. We know that with a crisis there, this is an economic disruption, and then we have big measurement problems. So some of the concepts used so far, the econ economists know it as output gap, are inherently difficult to measure. We should try to find to a set of fiscal rules that is more easily observable and more straight to communicate in order for that to be more effective and in order to facilitate then this smooth path towards the fiscal policy that we want to see in the long run that is credible and sustainable. Very final point, next to the fiscal framework, I think we should also be thinking about a permanent central fiscal capacity for the Euro area in order to buffer future shocks to the economy. Next generation EU is a temporary facility. It was rightly decided to be one and it's oriented towards structural change. There could still be a need in the long run for the Euro area to have a buffer in terms of crisis affecting individual countries to be emerging that act, can act before we really move in a downturn towards country losing market access when the ESM comes in. So far for the architecture, banks, capital markets, fiscal. Again, the objective for me is, and I hope policymakers with their initiatives, with their energy can go through and carry this through. It's about sustainable wealth and equitable equitable prosperity. I see a lot of this as part of the current ongoing discussion. And I think the prospects of getting there this time after the pandemic are much higher than they were after the past crisis. So I hope on that positive note, I can conclude and look forward to discuss it, the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stahl. Uh, we have some already quite a few questions pouring in. I encourage the audience to use the Q&A uh, possibility to ask. But I would like to uh, start with uh, still going back to what you mentioned about the reforms of ESM uh, based on an uh, amendment signed by ESM Treaty back in January this year. And you already briefly described what these reforms involve. But there is a, a question is, uh, uh, what role does the ESM envisions in the next generation EU, especially with regards to redistribution of the wealth? So, 
Next Generation EU is overall an initiative that is developed under the umbrella of the European Commission. So from that perspective, the governance and the disbursement of Next Generation EU is with the European Commission and not directly with the ESM. Are we related to this? Yes, we are in, a, in, in two respects. One is that Next Generation EU, one of the points that it actually achieves, it increases very much the available European safe assets in financial market. And that has also a big impact on market confidence. And there are the colleagues then of Jürgen that actually work on this in the commission. One of our colleagues has joined actually the, the, the commission team as well. And here we see there is very close cooperation. And we see that also financial markets are reacting and looking more at this as really a European set of institutions, a European market for safe assets. So where the European Commission, the EIB and the ESM are part of. That is one of the areas of interaction. The other area of interaction is obviously also then on the economic side, where we are in close contact with European Commission colleagues in actually looking at the countries, looking at the countries that have a relationship with us through, our, through formal programs, where we still do kind of post-program monitoring in order to, re, to ensure repayment. And here we discuss a lot with commission colleagues and also in looking at the Euro area more broadly or the Euro area country more broadly. For example, when we proposed the crisis support, the pandemic support scheme, we had an eligibility assessment had to be done. And that eligibility assessment was done jointly with European Commission colleagues. So there is very close interaction in that area, even though governance per se between next generation EU and ESM is separate. Thank you. I have been delegated to ask a question from our neighbors, the Stockholm School of Economics, because uh, our colleague Martin Hansen was not able to participate today. And he wanted me to ask you about Italy. Italy's debt to GDP ratio has risen sharply during the pandemic and was high already before. Is it likely that Italy might need help from ESM someday? And does ESM has enough firepower to actually help Italy? That is obviously a very important, interesting question. And it's a question that is raised to us from the very first day that I basically joined uh, the EFSF at the time in 2010, people were asking, and what happens to Italy? And when is Italy knocking, so to speak, maybe at, on your door? Now, I think what we need to keep in mind is what I said in general and what, what Jürgen showed you on the charts about financing costs. And that also holds for Italy. So even though Italian debt is now much higher than it was in the 1990s, at the same time, the interest rate burden for Italy nowadays is only one third of what it was at the time. At the time, it was about 11%. Now it's about 3%. So which inherently means that the, what I said before, debt carrying capacity of Italy is higher in that regard because just the burden has declined. So I do not expect Italy to be in a position to soon <laughs> uh, come to the SM to the contrary. Italy has kind of clear firm market access. And uh, I don't know whether Jürgen, you want to add something on, on, on the position, uh, uh, but if you look at spreads, there is at this stage no reason to worry. <clears throat> Having said that, however, it's also clear that for Italy as any other country, and here in our mind, we always obviously also have Greece in our mind, where the debt burden is even higher. The point to have a credible fiscal path that actually helps to stabilize debt and eventually reduce debt in order to keep market trust also forward looking is an important element. So I'm not immediately concerned, but at the same time, it's also clear that this market trust must be kept and must certainly also be kept when 
the economic policy measures may be changing over time and the support that the ECB can be giving to countries in creating favorable financing conditions is, is removed. So that would be my, my view on uh, that question. I don't know, Jürgen, do you- Just a short uh, comment on market access because that is uh, of course also a key element and it has, it has never and neither in the last pandemic season here nor uh, the years prior to that really been an issue as compared to Greece. Often market participants uh, a few years back said, oh, Italy and Greece and put them somehow together. And I always said that you, you, you shouldn't do that. They are different countries, obviously with different backgrounds. And now um, what I see, and I, I, that's why I showed you also this tapering talk. So this spread movements of this risk uh, premium was a key element for us to see what does it do once we start to discuss tapering or so reducing measures. It didn't do anything really because people believe that market access and favorable financing conditions prevail. And um, we also have a very functioning and effective uh, funding uh, program in the, in the, uh, from the Italian management office, which is also smartly, in my opinion, this year implemented that. So there are well-funded and at favorable conditions. So there's also no risk to raise any uh, concern from a market side. Thank you. Thank you, Bels. And going back to ESM and the instruments in your hands and also the reforms, we have a question. Uh, has this crisis shown any weaknesses in the tool set of the ESM? And how does the ESM set, seize its tool set in the, in the role involving in the future, especially taking into account how with the current tool set, some countries were better at implementing programs uh, than others? Th thank you. This is ESM is there to help countries, is there to help people. And that is why we actually have reacted at the start of the pandemic in creating also an adjusting an existing instrument to make it, so to speak, adapted, to make it fit to the situation to support governments in the pandemic. And what happened is that with the pandemic, as I explained before, you did not have the past imbalances of that came from government policy. You had this external shock. The main purpose of help that was needed at that stage is to was to support governments in financing the healthcare measures and financing, giving support to the economy. No need at that stage to talk about pension reforms or other big movements, right? Just kind of immediate help. And that is why we then decided actually and designed the pandemic support facility that was meant to provide exactly that support for health expenditures up to 2% of GDP with basically no policy conditionality attached to it, except for using the money for the purpose that it's meant to serve, which, was, which is healthcare. Now we implemented and the, early on the governments decided on the tool we implemented it hasn't been requested so far. And we are often asked, so what, is it not useful? I think it is useful. And Jürgen has just shown to you why it was useful at the time also in order to support market confidence. And that was an immediate impact that it had. Then we noticed that markets or actually governments also through the measures that were taken by the ECB and otherwise have those kind of favorable financing conditions and then have not immediately asked us for the support, even though, so the savings would be very, would be relatively small. That is the life of a backstop. That's the life of a crisis resolution mechanism. You are there to provide support when it is needed. So the instrument is available till 22. Maybe it will be used till then. If it won't be used till then, we have the resources available for in case there are other needs. And we can still say that indeed we contributed to the overall functioning of the economy by instilling this confidence effect. That is how I look at it. So we adjusted the instruments, we created that one that was helpful. Forward looking after the, after the pandemic, we will see how the, what the needs are and how the situation evolves and whether member states will agree or will think that ESM can have another role as a stabilization facility in also securing the stability of the, of the euro area forward looking. 
but that's a future discussion. Thank you. Uh, then we have an interesting question is, is the ESM participating in the discussions on the potential implementation of central banks digital currency in the EU? And might this digital currency be useful tool for ESM? This is a, a very big topic of our days. Um, we are not a central bank, so we are not directly involved, but we are obviously participating in the discussion because we think it's very important. What is very close to our heart is the international role of the euro. And how, because we are an international financial institutions, we issue to the markets, we invest in markets. So we are very close to that. We have to look at financial stability. We think that the digital currency can be one contributing factor to a strong international role of the euro. And a strong international role of the euro overall will help to stabilize the international financial system. So from that perspective, we think it would be a good move. It would be an important move. We see that the central bank is focusing now on a digital currency for retail use. And that is perfectly appropriate and good in the long run, in our view, one may, one could even think about the broader use of a digital currency for wholesale operations, which would carry certain advantages. And then also an institution like the ESM would benefit even more from it. But given that we are not directly, so to speak, in the area where savers, individual users of currency, the individuals, the households, uh, actually use it, our direct impact, the direct impact for us as a financial institution is limited beyond the fact that obviously, as I said before, we want a strong role of the euro and it's one contributing factor here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, back to Greece, uh, one of the question is, uh, how in the countries with the historically low fiscal discipline, for instance, Greece, where several generations haven't paid taxes, the fiscal discipline is planned, how, it, how the fiscal discipline is planned to be reestablished as part of the ESM help provided repayment plan? This is, um, thanks, thanks for the question and the, it's obviously a, a, an important point of reflection. What is the lesson to be learned and how can we nowadays look at Greece? And we have that, tried to do this very thoroughly also ourselves as an institution in running different evaluation exercises. And particularly the last evaluation that we did was an evaluation specifically about the Greek adjustment program. Now, if I look at the Greek experience and then in, the, in, my, in my presentation earlier, I drew also some parallels between what, what Latvia, between Latvia and other countries. And I think in terms of harshness of adjustment, there is barely any case that matches Latvia except Greece. We must be very clear that Yes, Greece got way bigger support for, from European counterparts, from the European community, than in terms of magnitude than Latvia did. But nonetheless, the measures that were imposed on Greece for that purpose in order to readjust the economy were really harsh. And much of it was focused on strengthening the fiscal side of the public sector. So a lot of effort went into actually institution building, into improving the tax system and making the tax system more independent. That was a big effort in that, in that program. And I think we think actually with some success. If you look at Greek performance post program, they literally often had the highest primary surplus within the euro area or actually they overperformed the surplus targets that were set in the program. So from that perspective, I think it's also too much backward looking and saying, well, they, they never made it. How can they make it now? I think the Greek governments have worked hard on it in order to improve. And we continue our contact with them. And most recently, Klaus Regling, the managing director, was in Greece and talked to the authorities. We are still regularly going there for missions. Now we do it virtually, 
but indeed we are in contact with the authorities to discuss recurrent policy issues. And at this stage, also our main concern is not to, the direct concern is not to further improve the tax authority, but also to make the country seize the opportunities of next generation EU in getting a proper investment program going. So I think the focus has shifted someday, somewhat. And I'm, I'm personally, having gone through that experience, I'm also more positive on the Greek capacity to manage the revenue side of the budget and also manage the spending side. Thank you. I just wanted to recheck. Do we have a few more minutes for some questions or? For me, it's fine. We can have a few more okay, minutes. Thank you. Uh, then uh, there's a rather specific question uh, also from one of our colleagues, uh, professors here. After one year of operation of the SURE program, how would you evaluate the current results of the program and what are the few further steps in here? So the SURE program is the program of the European Commission that was created early on in order to back up and to provide financing for employment or unemployment related measures during the pandemic. The resources have basically been drawn almost entirely. So that program is largely exhausted. Again, I think it's part of the picture that how we successfully managed the crisis first by government stepping in and coming up with those support measures that facilitate to keep workers on the job and to avoid the labor market frictions that emerge from unemployment. And then we come with the European measure to support this in a solidarity way in order to create common conditions for countries and allow those countries that were hit hard by the crisis to benefit from favorable financing. So from my perspective, this is one of the clear initiatives where we can say this worked well in order to, to mitigate the crisis impact. Thank you. Uh, and the next question would be about the rising funds in the bond market. What are the risks, in your opinion, tied to rising funds in the bond market for the EU? And can the EU afford to rise funds via bonds the same way the US can? Yeah, I can, I can start. So the financing conditions in general, as mentioned, are very favorable also for issues like ourselves and also the European Commission. Uh, and as you know, on the show program and um, also the next generation, uh, refinancing will be done in these European markets mainly. Market access for all issues um, at, the, at present, if you look at the variety of issues in different rating classes, so the credit quality, if you look at the um, sizes they are able to issue, if you look at the yield levels, so we, we have different measures how to see was it relatively expensive to borrow it to other measures or not. They all flag that favorable conditions prevail and they stay for the time being with regards to the points that Rolf just mentioned, also under constant rechecking what will the central bank do. But I do not have any doubts at all. If I also look, uh, we were had just had a question on sure, um, how this financing, uh, financing this program went in markets it's uh, very similar to the ESM style with regards to the market access and the funding strategy. And um, as Rolf also mentioned, we have also contributed with uh, one colleague uh, over there because it's, it is a very established process. And because of that, because of an also market group concept, they also deploy um, with uh, around about 39 banks from all over the European a continent, I do not have any issues or see any issues why any kind of financing would not uh, work. And that is, by the way, last point, not because the rates are slow, but because it is also stepped up and established in a very um, yeah, performing and, and also resilient framework. And uh, I, I completely concur with that. And let me also highlight this one aspect that for me kind of is structurally important there. I mean, before the next generation EU and before the measures, the, this first pandemic package of 540 billion, we had about 800 billion of combined debt, European debt from European Commission, EIB and ESM in the market. So with those measures, that amount rises up to 2 trillion. Okay. So which means that this, so to speak, has bigger chance becoming kind of a European bond class, asset class in itself. 
And now with the next generation EU, this is the world's biggest program on green financing. This is, so to speak, a real change in the market. And at this stage, from Jürgen, his team, from all we know, there is no doubt, no doubt, that there is actually market demand for this. And I think it actually will support further the development of the European fiscal market, financial market, and will also, again, further support the international role of the euro. And in that regard, we, at this stage, we cannot say that the issuance of that safe asset per se creates a risk. To the contrary, it's a big opportunity. Thank you. And maybe a, a brief answer to a rather global and a, in a big way question. How, how have the past 10 years changed the role of the euro globally? Is the US dollar still the only basket currency? The euro and the international role of the euro weakened with the past crisis. Obviously, also because there was lack of confidence in Europe at some stage to manage the crisis. We see that in this crisis, in the international investor community, the belief in Europe and the ability of Europe to manage the crisis has actually increased. And that creates a firmer base for investment. Obviously, now the challenge is to live up to this. The role of the euro as an international currency has strengthened somewhat, but we need to look here in the long run. So this is about further strengthening the European infrastructure, strengthening European markets, capital market to really create a unified and deep market. That is what in the long run will largely help and support the international role of the euro. And again, we think it is important that Europe has, or the euro has this strong international role, not only for Europe itself, but also for the international financial system, because we have learned in the past, it's very risky. It can be destabilizing to only rely on one main currency, the dollar. So we in the long run hope that we would move more towards a multipolar system, where yes, there will be a very strong dollar and maybe the dollar in the lead, but also a strong and maybe stronger euro and maybe another currency like the, the Chinese renminbi that carry a role. But the euro should remain strong and strengthen further. Thank you. And maybe the last question, just to wrap the discussion. In your opinion, what will be the most challenging tasks for ESM in the next, uh, well, in the medium term, in the next six months up to one year? That is very clear for us. So now, as I said before, we are in the course of the ratification process for the new mandate. So that ratification process is scheduled to end before the end of this year so that the new mandate is fully in place as of next year. Now, my effort, the effort of all colleagues here in, in this building are very much concentrated of before being ready for this. So it's basically our promise to you, our promise to the European people to be ready to implement the new mandate. And that carries all our efforts. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Strauch, uh, Mr. Kraus. Uh, I would like to thank on behalf of my colleagues and there were quite a lot of students and uh, we can see also quite a lot of banking representatives from Latvia. I would like to really, really thank you for this conversation and I was happy we have a, had a quite a lot of questions. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, hope to see you in Riga in person quite soon. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you very much, thank you. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.